This is part one of a lecture on the evolutionary theories of aging and longevity from 828-2020. And today we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the evolutionary theories of aging, such as antagonistic pleiotropy and disposable soma theory. And we're also going to discuss some of the experimental evidence that supports Medawar and Hamilton's theories that as well as um, how Williams and Kirkwood contributed to our understanding of how aging has evolved. And so I'm going to start with a little bit of a review, and I just want you to take some time to um, either go back to what you remember, go back in your notes, um, and remember what Weissman's contribution to um, the theory of evolution and aging was. And he came up with this idea of a trade-off hypothesis. And so you should be able to um, identify what the trade-off hypothesis is. And Weissman also argued that aging is sort of a non-adaptive trait, which means that natural selection doesn't act on aging. And then we also talked about Peter Medawar, and he didn't argue so much that aging is non-adaptive um, or not under the control of natural selection. But what he argued is that the forces of natural selection decrease um, as age increases. And he did, um, basically came up with a theory called the mutation accumulation theory of, sen of senescence. Um, and so you should take a second um, and just go back and refresh yourself on what that theory actually states. And what Hamilton did um, is take Peter Medawar's um, idea on the force of natural selection, decreasing as age increases, and do the math to prove it. And so he developed a specific um, metric to measure the force of natural selection on mortality, and he found that it decreases after the start of reproduction. And he argued, based on his mathematical theory, that longevity could have evolved, and longevity genes were most likely those genes that allowed um, an organism to uh, reach reproduction. <laughs> and so these three men, Weissman, Medawar, and Hamilton, are important for developing sort of this theoretical idea of how longevity and aging may have evolved. Um, but in order to test those theories, um, we needed to do some experiments, right? And so you can imagine that trying to measure or test evolutionary theories of longevity is difficult because natural selection um, takes a very long time. And so if we want to do this in the lab, we use a method known as artificial selection. Or rather than letting nature select the traits that are, we're um, interested in studying, we, um, as the scientists, select the traits um, that we're interested in studying, and we basically collect eggs or offspring or progeny from some type of short-lived species that has the trait we're interested in, and then we just get rid of all of the offspring or eggs from those organisms that don't have the trait. And we continue in the process like that until the trait we're interested in studying, um, in this case one involved in longevity or aging, becomes dominant in a population. And you've seen artificial selection at work before, maybe not in the lab, but at least in terms of pet breeding as well as in crop breeding. And so whether or not, um, <coughs> whether or not they knew it at the time, um, those people involved in the breeding that domesticated dogs and created all these different dog breeds, as well as the people who domesticated brassica and created all these different crops by selecting for particular traits, um, were doing artificial selection. And so what this looks like in terms of an experiment can be seen here on the left. And so this shows how artificial selection can be used to create different lines of Drosophila melanogaster or fruit flies. And so we can start by beginning eggs from flies um, that lay eggs at 25 days of age, or kind of an early reproducing fly line. And we can select those individuals um, and put them over here. And then we can discard everybody else. And we can also take eggs that are collected from flies that reproduce at day 70, collect those eggs, 
and create a late reproducing line by just selecting progeny from these flies and discarding everybody else. Um, and this still takes a long time to do, even in Drosophila, which have a rather short lifespan. And so a process like this, creating two different lines of flies, one that reproduces early and one that reproduces late, using artificial selection, still I think, took about three years in the context of this experiment, which can be seen over here. And <coughs> this artificial selection protocol was used to study the intrinsic mortality rate in Drosophila. And so what you can see here are survival curves for female flies that were artificially selected for being either the early reproducers, which are seen in red, or the late reproducers, which are seen in blue. And when you look at percent survival over time or age, you can see that the flies that reproduce early live significantly shorter life um, or have a lower survival than those that reproduce late. And so those late reproducing flies or this late reproduction line actually seems to have an extended mortality. And it argues that there is this trade-off between lifespan and fecundity or the ability to lay eggs. And what artificial selection is sort of useful for, at least in this context, is to start studying the genes that are involved in this process. Because in the lab, we can control for all of the environmental factors, such as diet, um, levels of oxygen, competition. And so by removing all of those environmental factors, we can see that there's still a difference between the survival of these two different groups of flies. And that the genes involved in early reproduction versus late reproduction are what's likely controlling this mortality rate. And in addition, we can actually use artificial selection or these lines created by artificial selection to study extrinsic factors um, that affect mortality as well. And so starting with an early and late reproduction line, we can then look at mortality under sort of what are known as what the experimenters called high predation conditions, where they killed off about 90% of the population before starting this assay, and then looking to see what the effect of this high predation or this kind of increased death to the eggs or embryos, and what happened under those conditions to both the early reproducing and late reproducing flies. You can see that under these conditions, the early reproducers still had a shorter lifespan than those that reproduced late. But it shows also the usefulness of developing lines via artificial selection and using them to test how extrinsic or kind of environmental factors can affect mortality and survival. <laughs> and um, both of these experiments also sort of uh, help provide some evidence for Weissman's theory of the trade-off hypothesis where there's this idea of trade-off between living longer and reproducing more. And this trade-off hypothesis is not only seen when we use do artificial selection experiments in the lab, but also in the wild. And the way that we can study it in the wild and the way that we've gathered some evidence to support the trade-off hypothesis is by comparing the reproduction and lifespans of the same species in two different environments. Um, turtles are one example. You can compare the same species that lives on an island versus that lives in the mainland, and then compare reproduction and lifespans of those two populations. What we often see is that there is a trade-off between the time of reproduction and the lifespan, especially for land-based organisms like mammals and birds and reptiles. Um, and so those animals that reproduce later in life have a longer lifespan in the wild as well. So that further supports this idea of this trade-off between um, reproduction and then ultimately how long an organism lives. But one thing that is interesting is that trade-off hypothesis is not supported by any experiments um, observed in fish or ob observation in fish in the wild. Um, it's not really clear why that is. So ultimately, Weissman's trade-off hypothesis 
has been supported in the laboratory um, in studies in Drosophila, and it has been supported in the wild as well. And one important thing to take away um, from these experiments is that longevity seems to have evolved through genes that are selected for improving fitness and reproductive success. But aging seems to not have evolved. Aging is still a random process that is not um, affected by natural selection. And so being able to separate the idea of longevity or the maximum lifespan of a species from aging is one other thing we've gained from um, experiments studying, art, um, studying longevity and aging in the lab.